We have previously talked quite a lot about isomers, including constitutional isomers like propanol, propenol and methyl oxirane here, which have different atom-to-atom -atom connectivity, or configurational isomers like these E and Z hexene isomers, which are diastereomers or diastereoisomers, or R and S alanine, non-superimposable mirror images, which we call enantiomers. This video focuses on conformational isomers, like these two isomers of ethane, which might be interconverted by rotating around the central carbon-carbon bond in the molecule. This is what distinguishes conformational isomers from other types of isomer. Conformers can be interconverted by rotating around a single bond. Contrast this to configurational isomers. To convert R-alanine into S, we would have to break one or more bonds, a much higher energy process. Rotating around a single bond is usually very easy, i.e. a low energy process, and therefore happens quickly and often at room temperature. Contrast the energy required to rotate around the carbon-carbon bond in ethane, which is 12 kilojoules per mole, to the energy required to break a carbon-carbon bond, which is close to 350 kilojoules per mole. This means that it can be hard to see individual conformational isomers and to distinguish them from each other. But it is possible, usually at low temperature using spectroscopic methods, and more important, for our purposes, there are contexts in which conformation impacts significantly on reactivity, and therefore it matters a lot. Before we go any further, we need to know how to draw different conformations. Remember that in these two structures, and others like them, the thick wedged bonds are coming out of the page towards us, while the hashed or dashed ones are going into the page away from us. Well, there are two particularly useful ways of representing conformational isomers. Sawhorse projections, like these, show the bond of interest somewhat elongated and the groups attached coming off at the right sorts of angles. These are three-dimensional perspective views that vaguely resemble the builder's sawhorse. The second way to draw conformers is using Newman projections. To draw a Newman projection for ethane, imagine you are extremely small, standing in front of the molecule and looking straight down the carbon-carbon bond. The carbon atom nearest to you is a dot at the centre of the Newman projection, and from this viewpoint, the three groups bonded to this carbon are drawn extending from that dot at 120 degrees to each other. Then the carbon further from you is drawn as a circle around the central dot, and the groups attached to this carbon extend as lines from the circle. So the Newman projection for this left-hand structure looks like this. Doing the same for the right-hand structure, imagine you are very small and looking straight down this bond. The carbon nearest you is a dot at the centre of the Newman projection, with groups extending at 120 degrees to each other from it. The carbon behind is a circle, with its groups also extending at 120 degrees. In this particular isomer, where the groups are overlapping with each other, we usually offset the groups at the back carbon just enough to allow us to see them clearly. Now we can show structures in which the three hydrogen atoms on the front carbon are as far away as possible from the three hydrogens on the back carbon, as on the left, and a conformation in which the six hydrogen atoms are as close to each other as they can get, as on the right. We call these conformations staggered and eclipsed, respectively. Which do you think is higher in energy, i.e. less stable? Well, it turns out that having the attached atoms eclipsing is less favourable than arranging them as far apart as possible, as this graph of relative energies attests. You can see the structures with eclipsing hydrogen atoms shown along the top at higher energy than the staggered conformations along the bottom. The energy difference between them is 12 kilojoules per mole that we saw earlier as the barrier to rotation around this carbon-carbon bond. There are two potential explanations for this observation. First, the electrons of the CH bonds repel each other, and arranging them as far away from each other as possible minimizes these adverse interactions. This is the concept of torsional strain. The second explanation involves hyperconjugation between the CH sigma bond on one carbon and the sigma star antibonding orbital 
of a CH on the other carbon. This is a stabilizing effect, and it is greatest when the two orbitals are exactly parallel, as occurs in the staggered conformation. A couple more things to note before we leave this curve. First, have a look at the y-axis. The relative energy differences here are small, and interconversion is rapid at room temperature. Secondly, the x-axis. This is a measure in degrees, and what we are showing is called the dihedral angle. That is the angle between the two chosen atoms on adjacent carbons, the orange and green hydrogens in this case, but could also be other groups such as methyl or chloro in a more complicated example. This curve follows the dihedral angle theta along the x-axis, plotting the relative energy as we rotate the back carbon of ethane relative to the front one. Let's make things a little more complicated and talk about butane. If we consider the central carbon-carbon bond of this molecule, then each carbon atom in that bond has two hydrogen atoms and a methyl group extending from it. Imagining ourselves very small again and drawing Newman projections, we can picture a number of different conformations now. On the left here, we have an isomer in which the methyl groups are as far apart as possible, 180 degrees from each other. And on the right, the two methyl groups are eclipsing each other in very close proximity. However, there are several other conformational isomers to consider now as well. There is this one, in which the two methyl groups are 120 degrees from each other and each eclipsing a hydrogen. Another staggered conformation, but one in which the methyl groups are only 60 degrees from each other. A similar but different staggered geometry, and one last eclipsed conformation, from which another 60 degree rotation would get us back to our starting point on the left of the screen. You won't be surprised, given how much organic chemists like naming things, to hear that each of these different conformations has its own name. When the methyl groups are 180 degrees apart, as far away from each other as possible, we call this the anti-periplanar geometry. When the methyl groups are 120 degrees apart, each eclipsing a hydrogen, we call this geometry anticlinal, and there are two of these. When the methyl groups are 60 degrees from each other, this staggered conformation is known as synclinal. Again, there are two of these, which are also sometimes called gauche. And the conformation in which the methyl groups eclipse each other is known as synperiplanar. That's quite a lot to take in. If you remember only one of these conformations, make it antiperiplanar, as we'll be coming back to this one in the context of elimination reactions soon. Now, what about the relative energy of these conformations? Note that in this curve, the x-axis reflects the dihedral angle between the two methyl groups. Well, as with ethane, eclipsing interactions are unfavorable, while staggered conformations maximize the orbital overlap required for hyperconjugation, which is stabilizing. But now there's a little bit of extra destabilization when the two bigger groups are eclipsed with each other in the synperiplanar conformation, and a little more stabilization to be gained when they are as far apart as possible from each other in the antiperiplanar conformation. So the relative energy curve looks like this. Note that these are again fairly small energy differences. The overall energy difference between the least stable synperiplanar geometry and the most stable antiperiplanar is less than 20 kilojoules per mole. And remind yourself that to break a carbon-carbon bond, we're needing close to 350 kilojoules per mole. These conformational effects really are rather subtle. Well, that's enough for now. We will build on these ideas in class this week and learn more about contexts in which confirmation can have a significant impact on reactivity. As always, there's more in the recommended text, Claydon, Greaves and Warren. It's in Chapter 16 of the second edition and Chapter 18 of the first.